Thank you very much for that nice introduction, Jenna. It's a pleasure to be here tonight, and I greatly appreciate the CIS, the Seminary Co-op Bookstore, and iHouse all being willing to sponsor my talk. And I'd especially like to thank Jamie Bender, who invited me to be here tonight. And most importantly, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out to hear me speak. As Jenna said, I'm going to speak tonight about my new book, uh, Why Leaders Lie, The Truth About Lying in International Politics. And let me start by telling you how I became interested in the subject. In the spring of 2003, Serge Schmemann, who then wrote for the New York Times, was doing a piece for the Sunday Week in Review section on international lying. And he called me up and he said that for some reason, when thinking about the subject, my name popped into his head. <laughs> I had never met him before, um, but he asked me, what were my thoughts about international lying? And I said to him, uh, I've never thought about the subject before. Uh, and I said, as best as I as best as I can recall, there's no literature on it. So I said, why don't you tell me what you're thinking about it, and then I'll bounce off your ideas. So we talked for about an hour uh, and had a very fruitful discussion about international line. And after I hung up the telephone, I made some notes and I stuck them, stuck them in a folder. A few months later, MIT asked me if I'd come and give a talk, and they said I could talk on any subject I wanted. So I said, what the heck, I'll talk about international line. So I pulled out my notes and over the next week or two, I crafted a talk, went to MIT and gave it. And what I found was that people were fascinated by the subject. Uh, and then I gave more talks and everywhere I went, I found that people were fascinated by the subject. So I eventually wrote a paper and then I decided to turn the paper into a short book. And that's how I ended up writing uh, the book I'm going to talk about tonight. Now, the key premise in the book is that lying sometimes makes strategic sense. It sometimes makes good sense for the leaders of a particular country to lie. Uh, lying is a useful tool of statecraft in my argument. Now, in the beginning of the book, I distinguish between selfish lies and strategic lies. Selfish lies are leaders that lie, or lies that leaders tell that are designed to benefit them. Strategic lies are lies that leaders tell to benefit the country. And let me give you an example that's actually quite controversial that illustrates this division. Uh, in the book, I talk about four lies that the Bush administration told in the run-up to the Iraq war. And I make the argument that the Bush administration did not tell those lies for selfish reasons. None of the individuals in the administration who lied were going to benefit from those lies personally. They told those lies because they thought it was in the American national interest to go to war against Iraq. As you all know, or as hopefully all of you know, that was a boneheaded decision. <laughs> but nevertheless, they thought they were doing the right thing. And they waged this deception campaign for what they thought were positive ends. It's also important to emphasize that I talk about noble lies in the book. I make the argument that there are some lies that our leaders have told over time, which I think can be categorized as noble lies. And the best example is the lying that President Kennedy did during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, in that crisis, uh, Nikita Khrushchev, who was his counterpart on the Soviet side, told Kennedy that he would take the Soviet missiles out of Cuba, provided that Kennedy take the Jupiter missiles, the American Jupiter missiles, out of Turkey. 
as almost all of you know, Turkey is right next door to the Soviet Union, and uh, those Jupiter missiles looked to the Soviets a lot like the Soviet missiles in Cuba looked like us, and Khrushchev wanted them out. Actually, Kennedy had no problem taking them out, because when he had assumed the office of the presidency in January 1961, he had ordered the Pentagon to take the Jupiter missiles out of Turkey. He didn't want the Jupiter missiles in Turkey, but the Pentagon had failed to take the Jupiter missiles out. So he was, you know, not worried for strategic reasons about those missiles being removed from Turkey. But he felt that uh, if the American public found out about the deal, he would have to renege on the deal. And he also felt that if the Europeans, especially the Turks, found out about the deal, they would think that the United States' commitment to defend Europe was not very firm and that America was willing to compromise Europe's security to maximize America's security. So Kennedy told Khrushchev, you, we have a deal, we have a deal, but you cannot announce that we have that deal and if you do announce that we have that deal, I will deny it. And furthermore, if someone here in the United States smells that a deal has been made and starts asking questions, you want to understand that I'm going to lie about it. Needless to say, a number of journalists and others smelled the deal and started asking questions about whether or not Kennedy had agreed to trade the Jupiters for the Soviet missiles in Cuba. And Kennedy lied and said there was no such deal. And when I was young, I believed, as did almost everybody else who studied the Cuban Missile Crisis, that there had been no deal and that Kennedy had stood his ground and insisted that Khrushchev take the missiles out without a quid pro quo. But we were wrong because he had lied to us. I'm glad he lied to us and I'm glad they cut the deal because it ended the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I think that the Cuban Missile Crisis was the closest the United States came to war during the Cold War. And given that both sides had thermonuclear weapons and there was a chance that a war would have escalated to the nuclear level, I think it was imperative that President Kennedy shut down that crisis. And if he had to tell a lie to the American people and to the Europeans to do it, so be it. So my argument is, but there's a distinction between strategic lies and selfish lies. And what I'm talking about tonight is strategic lies. And I'm also making the argument that sometimes those lies turn out to be noble lies. This is not to say that sometimes those lies don't turn out to be blunders. And again, I did reference the Bush administration and its deception campaign in the run-up to the Iraq war. Now, what exactly do I mean when I'm talking about lying? It's important to get the definitions down. My basic schema looks like this. There's truth telling on one side and there's deception on the other side. And underneath deception, there's lying, spinning, and concealment. And I'll walk you through the definitions of all of those. But you want to understand that at the highest level, there's a distinction between Truth-telling and deception. Truth-telling is where an individual goes to great lengths to tell a story uh, in a straightforward manner and in as truthful a way as possible. Deception, of course, is the opposite. And among the three kinds of deception, lying usually means saying something that is not true. If Jenna asked me, did I go to Kansas City yesterday? And I said, no, when in fact I did go to Kansas City yesterday, that would be a lie. But there's actually another form of lying. And that comes when a person does not make one statement or a series of statements that are untrue but nevertheless makes a series of statements that are designed to lead the listener to a false conclusion. 
So you're purposely deploying your statements, and none of those statements by themselves are false. You're purposely deploying those statements to lead the listener to a false conclusion. That's different than actually saying something that you know to be untrue. And let me give you an example for each one of those kinds of lying, again, going to the Bush administration and the run-up to the Iraq war. Uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld said on September 27, 2002, he said that we have, quote-unquote, bulletproof evidence of a link between Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein. Approximately two years later, on October 4th, 2004, he told the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, quote, to my knowledge, I have not seen any strong, hard evidence that links the two. That's a lie. It's a bold-faced lie. An example of the second kind of lying has to do with the argument that the Bush administration made that Saddam was in part responsible for September 11th. When we went to war in March of 2003, well over half of the American people believed that Saddam was in part responsible for September 11th. This was because the Bush administration went to enormous lengths to convince you that that was the case. They never said, however, that Saddam was directly responsible for what happened on September 11th. But they made a series of statements over time that were designed to make you believe that Saddam helped perpetrate September 11th. So those are the two kinds of lying. Then there's concealment and spinning. Concealment is where you simply don't tell the other party about certain facts. And again, to go to the run-up to the Iraq war. Uh, and again, to focus on the link between Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein. Uh, we uh, interrogated both Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the principal architect of the attacks, and Abu Zubaida, and both of them told us in separate uh, engagements that uh, Saddam and Osama bin Laden had nothing to do with each other, and in fact, they intensely disliked each other. The Bush administration, not surprisingly, concealed that information from us because the Bush administration wanted to give us the impression that the two of them were joined at the hip. But that's concealment, it's not lying. The third form of deception, which we all engage in in our daily lives, is spinning. Spinning is where you don't tell an outright lie, you just arrange the facts in a story to present yourself in a most positive light or to present an issue that you care about in the most positive light. You leave out the negative parts or you downplay the negative parts. When a boy and a girl flirt with each other, they engage in spinning. If President Obama were up here and we asked him, what's the state of the American economy? He would engage in spinning. He would tell us all the positive aspects of the economy. He would downplay the negative or conceal the negative aspects. If John Boehner, on the other hand, were up here and we asked him, he'd paint a very different picture, but he too would spin. Neither President Obama nor Mr. Boehner would lie. They would spin. So you have these three forms of deception, and I would argue that we all engage in spinning and concealment frequently, and in fact, there's no way that a society could work without a great deal of spinning and concealment. But lying, on the other hand, is a different matter. If somebody said that one of the real problems with John Mearsheimer is that he's a liar, that would bother me greatly. If all of you thought that I was a liar, that would not sit well with me. If you think that I'm misguided, well, I can live with that. But being called a liar is not something that most people 
cotton to. So, given that lying is such a special category of deception, I figured it made a lot of sense to think about how it applied to international politics. Now, what I discovered is that there are five kinds of international lies, excuse me, five kinds of international lies. And, and let me tell you what the five kinds of lies are. Uh, the first kinds of lies are interstate lies. Interstate lies are where the leader of one country lies either to the leader of another country or to a foreign audience. And let me give you a good example of that. During the Cold War, the United States was very interested in convincing the Soviet Union that we would use nuclear weapons to defend Europe were the Soviets to attack into Western Europe. And this is in large part because the threat of nuclear use by the United States was a wonderful way of deterring the Soviets from attacking in the first place. If the Soviets thought that we were going to use nuclear weapons and a conventional war in Europe would therefore likely escalate to the nuclear level, they would never start such a war. So we had a vested interest in convincing the Soviets that we would use those nuclear weapons. Of course, it was not clear that we would use nuclear weapons to defend Europe. Because if the Soviets were overrunning Western Europe, as bad as that would be, it's nowhere near as bad as a general thermonuclear war that ends up in the United States getting incinerated. So there were all sorts of reasons to think we wouldn't use the nuclear weapons, which of course is why our leaders went to great lengths to say we would use nuclear weapons. Henry Kissinger and Robert McNamara both said when they were in positions of power that they would use nuclear weapons to defend Europe. Both of them later said that they would have never used nuclear weapons to defend Europe. And when they made those statements, they were bluffing. Bluffing, by the way, is a euphemism for lying. They were bluffing. I think it made eminently good sense for them to bluff because it helped make deterrence work in Europe during the Cold War. But the key point is they are admitting that they were lying. So interstate lying is the first kind of lying. Second kind of lying is fear-mongering. A euphemism for fear-mongering might be threat inflation. Fear-mongering is where a leader lies to his or her own public. It's very different than lying to another country. What the Bush administration did in the run-up to the Iraq war is an example of fear-mongering. The Bush administration understood full well that the American public was not enthusiastic about fighting a war against Iraq. So they felt that what they had to do was make it clearer than the truth, to borrow Dean Acheson's words, that Saddam Hussein was so dangerous that he had to be removed from power. And in the process, they told four separate lies. And more generally, they waged a deception campaign. And I, of course, have pointed out a number of those lies already. That's fear-mongering. And there are other examples as well. Lyndon Johnson, some of us in the audience uh, are old enough to remember uh, the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, where Johnson lied about what the North Vietnamese were doing in the Gulf of Tonkin. Uh, early in August 1964 because he wanted to get a resolution through Congress that basically gave him carte blanche to wage the Vietnam War. That's fear-mongering. Uh, a third kind of line is what I call strategic cover-ups. A good example of a strategic cover-up is President Kennedy lying about the deal that he cut with Nikita Khrushchev to end the Cuban Missile Crisis. What Kennedy was doing was employing a very controversial policy. He made a very 
important and controversial policy decision that he could not afford to tell the American people and the Europeans about. So he covered it up. He lied. That's what I call a strategic cover-up. It's a third kind of lying. Fourth kind of lying is nationalist myth-making. All states are infected with nationalism. And nationalism invariably involves telling lies about your past. What all countries do is engage in myth-making. They tell stories that portray themselves as the good guys and portray the other as the bad guys. We're all familiar with this process. The example I like to use because uh, it affected me at one point in time uh, has to do with uh, the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. Uh, when I was young, uh, I believed, and virtually everyone I knew believed, that the reason the Palestinians uh, left uh, what became Israel in 1948 was because the Arab leaders told them to leave because they were then going to come in and murder all the Jews and then the Palestinians could move back into uh, their homes and there would be no Jews left because the Arab armies would have finished all of them off. So in effect, it was the Palestinians' own fault for listening to the Arabs uh, and leaving uh, their homes and going uh, outside of mandatory Palestine and creating the problem of all these refugees. Uh, we now know, mainly through the work of Israeli historians, that this is not what happened. In fact, there's not a shred of evidence that that's what happened. What happened is that the Israelis ethnically cleansed uh, Palestine. They pushed uh, about 700,000 Palestinians out, and then they uh, would not allow them to return to their homes. Uh, this is a nationalist myth and the United States and all sorts of other countries have similar myths. I'm not picking on Israel here. Israel is not an exception in this regard. Uh, but this is nationalist myth-making. Then the final kind of line, international line, is um, liberal lies. Uh, we have today, uh, around the world, a, a well-established body of norms regarding how to think about war, how to think about when it's permissible to go to war, uh, how to think about uh, what is permissible in the conduct of war, and so forth and so on. And these norms are very closely aligned with basic just war theory. So when states go out and misbehave or act in ways that violate the laws of war, uh, they invariably go to great lengths to try and cover up what they did and portray it in uh, a very different manner. My favorite two liberal lies uh, involve, first of all, the Wehrmacht on the Eastern Front uh, in World War II and British bombing policy in that same conflict. Just with regard to the Wehrmacht, when World War II ended, uh, the United States found itself in a very interesting position during the war, we were allied with the Soviet Union fighting against Germany. During the Cold War, which followed World War II, we were aligned with Germany fighting against the Soviet Union. We switched partners and we switched adversaries. All of this is to say we effectively jumped into bed with a lot of people who had been key players in what is probably the most murderous regime in modern history. And because the Germans were so important for creating military power in the center of Europe during the Cold War, we had to clean them up. So we, working in conjunction with the Germans, cooked up the myth that the Wehrmacht, the German military, in particular the German army, had virtually nothing to do with all the murder and mayhem on the Eastern Front in World War II. 
The Wehrmacht, we argued at the time, and I of course believe this, had clean hands. And it was only the Einsatz group and the special police forces and so forth and so on that were involved in the killing that took place on the Eastern Front. Indeed, that was not true at all. It was a lie. The Wehrmacht was inextricably bound up in the German killing machine on the, in, on the Eastern Front. And the Wehrmacht did not have clean hands. It had filthy hands. But given that we needed the Wehrmacht, or the remnants of the Wehrmacht to create the Bundeswehr, we had to tell ourselves and tell others a story that was comprised of lies. And then the other case uh, involves Bomber Harris. Uh, in the spring of 1942, the British were desperate and they thought the only card they had to play against Germany was to use uh, their military uh, their air force to bomb civilian areas in Germany and kill as many German civilians as possible. But of course, the British did not want to uh, advertise to the world that they were purposely murdering civilians, which of course is what they were doing. They were murdering civilians. Uh, it's clearly against the laws of war uh, and international norms to purposely kill civilians. But that's what the British were doing uh, under Bomber Harris. So what did the British do? They lied. They said that they were bombing military targets and they were bombing economic targets. And they were not targeting civilians when in fact they were targeting civilians. That's a liberal lie. So the five kinds of lies I see are interstate lies, where leaders lie to foreign audience, fear mongering, where leaders lie to their own public to inflate a threat, strategic cover-ups, again, President Kennedy and the Cuban Missile Crisis, nationalist myth-making, this is countries inventing stories about their founding, for example, to make them look like the good guys and others look like the bad guys, and then liberal lies, which I just talked about. So those are the five kinds of lying. Now, what are the two main findings in the book? First, main finding is that there is not much interstate lying. I was actually shocked to discover this. I thought as a card-carrying realist and a cynic about international politics that I would find an abundance of cases of leaders lying to foreign audiences. I figured that diplomats lied all the time to each other. And there are actually famous quotes that make those kinds of arguments. That's not true. I found it very difficult to find examples of interstate lying. And all of those examples that I have in the book, I worked very hard to accumulate. What's very interesting is I'd go around and talk about this subject to audiences like this, and I would tell people that there's very little interstate lying. And I was always surprised at how cynical the audiences were because people would invariably say to me, this can't be true. There has to be a ton of lying out there. And then I would say to my interlocutors, look, go home, think about the list of cases for the next couple days, then send me an email. I'd give them a card, send me an email with all the lies, okay? And uh, invariably, I'd get a response uh, a week or so later, and the person would say, all I could think of was were three lies, and here they are. And usually two of them would not be lies, and the third one would be a case I already had. <laughs> Another cut at this, I would go talk to audiences and someone would say, are you gonna tell me that Saddam Hussein didn't lie? Are you going to tell me that Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran, has not lied to us? Are you going to tell me that the North Koreans didn't lie to us? And uh, I always say to people, uh, well, if they did lie, please show me where they lied. And nobody can come up with an example. I, I cannot find an example of where Saddam Hussein lied. Uh, and I'll say more about this in a minute. Uh, this is not to say Saddam Hussein was a good guy or Ahmadinejad is a good guy. The question is, did they lie to us? And I can't find any evidence. And again, people just don't believe this. They're remarkably cynical. 
It's not just old John, the realist, who's cynical. Uh, then my second finding uh, is that leaders seem to lie much more often to their own publics than to other countries. And uh, fear-mongering, in the American case, is especially prevalent. Uh, for those of you who have any doubts about this, there's a book by Eric Alterman, who writes for The Nation, who's a very fine historian, who's written a book on presidential lying. Uh, it's a remarkable book in that it's so depressing uh, because it's so filled with cases of our leaders lying to us. Um, just to tell you a story uh, about the, the book, uh, in the beginning of the book, uh, I, I tell the story about Saddam. When, when we didn't discover uh, weapons of mass destruction, many people argued that the reason that happened was that Saddam bluffed us. He bamboozled us. Saddam pretended that he had weapons of mass destruction when in fact he didn't. And that's why we were fooled into thinking that he had WMD. Uh, and supposedly, uh, the evidence to support this claim is in the Dolfer Report. Uh, I looked at the Dolfer Report. The Dolfer Report does make that claim. But there's no evidence in the Dolfer Report to back up that claim. And in fact, all the evidence shows that Saddam claimed that he had no WMD and that he was not lying. There's no evidence that he was bluffing. And if anybody can find any evidence, I would appreciate it if they would give it to me. I've talked to all sorts of people. So Saddam didn't lie uh, to us in the run-up to the Iraq war or throughout the 1990s. But President Bush did lie to us in the run-up to the Iraq war. And this is consistent with my two main findings, that leaders don't lie to other leaders very often, but leaders lie to their own public. Now the question you want to ask yourself, and really this is the $64,000 question, is why is this the case? Why did I find that there's not much interstate lying and there's actually quite a bit of lying by leaders to their domestic publics? I think the key variable is trust. There is not a lot of trust in international politics. And if there's not a lot of trust, it's difficult to lie. States tend not to trust each other. Remember Ronald Reagan's famous dictum when he was dealing with the Soviet Union, trust but verify. Just think about those words, trust but verify. What Reagan was saying, you can't trust the Soviets. We have to verify that they will stick to the various arms control agreements that we are signing or negotiating. Of course, the Soviets felt the same way. They wouldn't trust us. The Chinese and the Americans today and down the road don't trust each other, especially when important security issues are on the table. They don't trust each other. They prefer to verify. They want some good reason to believe that the Americans will stick to an agreement, and we want some good reason to think that the Chinese will stick to an agreement. States don't trust each other very much. When it comes to domestic politics, the opposite's the case. Publics tend to trust their leaders. After all, our leaders are tasked with the mission of protecting us. They're part of the same tribe that we're in. We expect them to look out for our welfare. There's trust there that doesn't exist among states. Uh, just to give you uh, a good Example to highlight this, uh, J. William Fulbright, who was the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and a very powerful senator, uh, and who was very skeptical about Vietnam, uh, but nevertheless helped President Johnson push through the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, despite his skepticism about Vietnam. He said afterwards, the biggest lesson, the biggest lesson I learned from Vietnam is not to trust government statements. I had no idea until then. Get that? 
The biggest lesson I learned from Vietnam is not to trust. There's the key word, trust. I like to tell the story that in the run-up to the Iraq war, I heard Scott Ritter, who was a weapons inspector, talk about the presence of WMD in Iraq. And uh, after listening to Ritter talk, I was convinced that uh, Iraq did not have WMD. He was so knowledgeable and so convincing. Uh, I said, he's got to be right. A few weeks later, uh, I heard uh, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld say that uh, we know that Iraq has WMD because we know where they are. And I said to myself, the Secretary of Defense wouldn't say that if he didn't know where they are, right? Uh, so maybe Scott Ritter was making a good faith effort in giving us his, us, giving us his assessment uh, of the situation, but I think he's probably just wrong, and Rumsfeld obviously has access to information that Ritter does not have access to, and he wouldn't lie to us in such a bold-faced way. So I changed my mind, and I then went about telling people that there was good reason to think that he did have WMD, uh, when in fact, of course, he didn't, and Rumsfeld was lying to us. But you see, in my case, as in Fulbright's case, and this may have been true of many of you, we trusted our leaders. And it's really hard for a country to function well if nobody trusts their leaders, right? So it's that presence of trust that makes lying to one's public much easier to pull off than lying to another country where there tends not to be uh, a whole heck of a lot of uh, uh, trust. Now, I want to make two sets of comments in conclusion. First of all, I have basically argued up to now that there are real virtues to telling lies, selective lies in international politics. I've even made the case that it sometimes makes sense for leaders to lie to their own people. However, it is important to understand that there is a real downside to lying. And I think that's especially true when you talk about fear-mongering. Not so much interstate lies, but fear-mongering. And let me tell you what the two real dangers associated with lying are, and then let me talk about how each of those dangers relates to fear-mongering. Uh, the two f dangers are what I call blowback and backfiring. Now, what exactly is blowback? Blowback is where a leader who lies to his or her public about foreign policy soon finds him or herself lying about domestic politics and fostering what I would call a culture of dishonesty. If a leader feels compelled to lie to the public about a foreign policy threat, what that leader is in effect saying is that the public can't deal with the issue by being told the truth. There's just something wrong with the public. It's either not sophisticated enough, it's too ignorant, or it doesn't care. It could be any one of these reasons. But the public, right, has to be manipulated to do the right thing what fear-mongering is really all about. As you surely understand, it's not a giant leap to go from making that kind of calculation about foreign policy to making the same calculation about domestic policy and lying to your public on both fronts. And that fosters a culture of dishonesty, in my opinion, and it is very dangerous because there's no way that a society can function well if dishonesty is rampant. So that's blowback. The other downside to international lying is backfiring. And fear-mongering is another... Fear-mongering is a case where backfiring is likely to happen. Backfiring is where the, 
the lie doesn't work uh, the way you intended it to work, or the policy that the lie helps create doesn't work. And look at what happened with the Bush administration. The Bush administration waged a deception campaign in the run-up to the Iraq war. They were successful at bamboozling large chunks of the American people. They got their war, but the war was a disaster. What that tells me is that the reason they couldn't tell us the truth, the reason they had to wage a deception campaign was because their ideas about Iraq were wrong-headed to begin with. If they had told us the truth, we wouldn't have had a war and we wouldn't have had this disaster. The reason they had to lie, the reason that they had to wage a deception campaign in the run-up to the Iraq war was because they were pursuing a boneheaded policy. The fact that they couldn't tell us the truth and get us to go along was evidence that the policy was wrong-headed. Same thing is true with Lyndon Johnson in the run-up to the Vietnam War with regard to the Gulf of Tonkin incident in particular. The reason President Johnson had to distort the truth was because if he didn't do that, he wouldn't have gotten permission to wage the Vietnam War. And of course, the Vietnam War was an even greater disaster than the Iraq War. So in both cases, although President Johnson and company and President Bush and company told lies to the American people for what they thought were good strategic reasons, and they were successful at getting us into those two wars, it in the end backfired and we ended up in disastrous wars. So you see that fear-mongering is a very dangerous way of doing business because it can blow back into the body politic and poison the culture, and furthermore, it can lead to policies that ultimately fail. Finally, let me just say in conclusion that the countries that fearmonger the most are democracies that wage preventive wars against distant threats. Again, the countries in which leaders lie to their publics most often about foreign threats are countries that are democracies that wage preventive wars against distant threats. That, in a nutshell, is the United States of America. Given that the United States seems committed to trying to run the world, given that the United States is a democracy, given that the United States seems committed to using military force liberally, just think about Libya, it seems that we should expect to have lots more evidence of fear-mongering in the years ahead. And therefore, it will probably be the case that when I come back here in 20 years to talk about the new edition of my book, I will reference <laughs> Eric Alterman's second volume on presidential lying. Thank you. I will, I will gladly take questions, and if folks could just come up to the microphone uh, that's right here and line up and just fire away. And if you would make your questions as succinct as possible, that would be appreciated. And I will try to answer them as succinctly as possible. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, my name is Adam Shakoff. I'm a first year undergrad at the University of Chicago. I'm just curious to see what your thoughts are on the relationship between investigative journalism and strategic lying. Like, even though you have, you know, John F. Kennedy lying about the deal with uh, the Soviet Union, you know, you said journalists like still, uh, you know, caught this the whiff of like that a deal had been made. Like, to what extent? Like, I guess you could say like, what, to what extent? Like, is there like a reasonable boundary between like reasonable between like a reasonable secrecy or a state's right to secrecy yeah. versus like? journalistic responsibility. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's very 
Did everybody, everybody heard the question? Uh, His question deals with the tension between investigative journalists on one hand who are looking to uncover the truth and leaders who are interested in waging deception campaigns and in some cases uh, telling lies. And he was interested in how I think about that relationship. Uh, I think that there is no doubt that journalists are in principle committed to finding out what's really going on and reporting it to the American people. And that's why in a number of cases that I looked at in the book, uh, you see presidents and their lieutenants lying to journalists. Uh, I tell the story in there about how Jody Powell, who was President Jimmy Carter's principal spokesman, lied to a journalist about the aborted Iran rescue mission. And there are a number of other cases as well. But I would say that what's happened in the United States, and this was clear in the run-up to the Iraq war, is that the mainstream media has basically abandoned its interest in ferreting out the truth and challenging the administration, and instead has become a useful tool for presidents who want to tell lies to the American people. I think one of the principal reasons that we, collectively, were bamboozled by the Bush administration in the run-up to the Iraq war is because the American mainstream media failed to do its job. You said that interstate uh, lying is actually relatively infrequent, and I wonder if that's a modern occurrence or a historical one. In the run-up to the Second World War, particularly in 1937 and 1938, uh, there were many protestations from Germany that it had fulfilled all of its uh, interests with respect to uh, acquiring additional territory. Uh, and right up until 1939, uh, uh, was, uh, the country was constantly claiming that it was not, it had no intentions to uh, uh, engage in an aggressive war. You posited the idea between, the, the contrast between a lie and a stark truth with your, did I travel to Kansas City um, example, but you didn't talk very much about when people talk about their intentions and I wonder if the nature of intentions is much less, um, uh, it, it's much less clear when countries are lying or not lying for inter interstate reasons. Okay, uh, those are two excellent questions. First on the 1930s and Hitler, uh, there is no question that uh, he lied on a number of occasions in the 1930s about his intentions and about German capabilities as well. And I document them in the book. Uh, he is a good case for me when I'm looking for examples of interstate line. And I would just say to you, you want to remember my point is, and you stated it, but I'll just repeat it, that lying does take place. It's just that it's infrequent. Uh, but Hitler is a good example, so I have no problem with what you said there. With regard to intentions, uh, there is no question that it is very hard to discern what the intentions of a particular leader are at the time. Okay, so when Hitler says uh, that he has no intention of going on the offensive after he gets the Sudetenland as a result of the Munich Agreement, uh, we have no way of knowing at the time what his intentions are. That's your point. And I, I think you're absolutely correct. And as a number of the students in the audience who know my writings on IR theory uh, would tell you, I place a very high premium on that basic logic uh, for explaining how I think the world works. So I'm in agreement with you. But nevertheless, you can look at what a leader's intentions were, in some cases, after the fact, 
and determine whether or not they were telling the truth at the time. At the time of Munich, it was very difficult to tell exactly what Hitler's intentions were, which is in large part why they gave him the Sudetenland. They thought that if he had the Sudetenland, which included all these Germans in it, that that would be the end. He'd be a problem, but not that big a problem. But we later found out that his intentions were far more ambitious than that. Uh, so it's obvious that he lied, and that's why you were able to point out that he lied on a number of occasions in the 1930s. So intentions are hard to figure out at the time, but later on, you sometimes can figure out whether someone lied or not about their intentions. Yeah, history seems to be largely retrospective. <laughs> um, near the beginning of your talk, uh, you um, uh, suggested a dichotomy, which I'd like to ask you about. Uh, that was uh, selfish lies versus strategic lies. And for selfish lies, you were saying to benefit the self versus uh, strategic lies to benefit the country. But it seems to me that this is rather too limiting uh, there are also, I would think, uh, categories of lies to benefit, oh, uh, domestically speaking, say, big donors or um, internationally large corporations and uh, military corporations, oil companies and whatnot. Yes. And perhaps also um, uh, even another category of uh, the greater good, whatever a president might interpret that as. Uh, I wonder if you could uh, elaborate on that and perhaps uh, enlarge the dichotomy to uh, accommodate these other possibilities. Yeah, I, I would categorize those sorts of lies <clears throat> that you described as selfish lies, where the leader, obviously acting in cahoots, say with the oil company, uh, the oil companies or some element of the military industrial complex, told a lie for their benefit, and that would obviously be to his or her benefit as well. So that'd be a selfish lie. Yeah, do we ever have a greater good uh, consideration uh, well, well, the above and beyond strategic relations between nations? No, uh, in, in my lexicon, a strategic lie is done for the greater good. Uh, again, I believe that the Bush administration and the Johnson administration lied about uh, the uh, Iraq, lied lied in the run-up to the Vietnam and Iraq wars because they thought they were doing it for the greater good. They thought it was in the national interest. I guess I was thinking supranational, supranationally in terms of the United Nations or oh, for hey, the oh, supranationally. <laughs> supranationally. Oh, I see what you're saying. Just trying to enlarge your categories. Yes, that's all. Yes, I, are you one. No, that's a very interesting question. I never thought about that. Uh, I never thought about it. By the way, just before I take this gentleman's question, I gave a talk uh, in Denmark last week on this, and a person got up and made what I thought was a very interesting point that I had not thought about. I told him I wish he had told me this before I wrote the book. I would have incorporated his idea. He said as a citizen, uh, he understood that leaders sometimes had to lie to the public. But he said that as far as he was concerned, it was only acceptable for his leaders to lie to him when the issue at stake was national survival, right? When there was an existential threat. So he could accept that the lie that John F. Kennedy told uh, in um, 1962. But a lot of the other lies that are told don't involve matters of survival. They don't deal with existential threats. And he said in those cases, he did not think it was acceptable for a leader to lie to his or her public, in large part because of the blowback effects, the fact that it poisoned uh, the social culture. Uh, so first of all, I'd just like to thank you for your time. Um, so thank you. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> Also, um, I'd just sort of like to extend uh, the first question that was asked um, regarding investigative journalism. Um, I just, uh, just recently, um, you're aware of the WikiLeaks, uh, I guess, phenomenon that has uh, been occurring the past couple yes. of months. 
Um, obviously, they're undermining some of the lies that uh, that nations have told, um, whether they be strategic or selfish lies. Um, so I was just wondering if how you regarded um, that sort of investigative journalism, if you selectively supported it, or if you were against it. Okay. Uh, with regard to WikiLeaks, it's not an example of investigative journalism. Uh, there was this man, Bradley Manning, who was a soldier in the army, who gave all of this data uh, to Julian Assange, and he then made it available to a handful of newspapers. Uh, and the newspapers have published uh, those documents, but this is not investigative journalism. As I said, the mainstream media doesn't do much investigative journalism anymore. The American media is basic, the American mainstream media is basically toothless. You young people in the audience can't appreciate it because you don't remember when the American mainstream media actually had some bite. Uh, but I can assure you it's toothless now, and presidents manipulate it with great ease. Uh, with regard to WikiLeaks, uh, I think that what you see, if you look at the documents that have been released so far, is number one, there's not much evidence of lying. There is some, for sure. And much of the lying is leaders lying to their own public, not lying to each other. And the best example of this is the head of Yemen, uh, who was in cahoots with the Americans, in particular with General Petraeus, to allow us to use the American Air Force to strike at al-Qaeda targets in Yemen. But the president of Yemen said, you can do that to General Petraeus, but you have to understand that I have to tell my people that it is the Yemeni's Air Force that's doing the attacking, not the American Air Force, because it would get me into an immense amount of trouble on the home front, right? And I am very interested, he, he had a vested interest in dealing with Al-Qaeda, right? So he had a good strategic reason for wanting to deal with Al-Qaeda. He couldn't do it himself. He was willing to let the Americans do it but he had to be able to tell his people that it was not uh, the Americans, it was his military, their military that was doing it. This is a strategic cover-up, by the way. Uh, the president of Yemen's cover was blown by the WikiLeaks documents. And one of the reasons that he's in so much trouble today and in danger of going overboard, being thrown overboard is because of WikiLeaks. So WikiLeaks has had a big influence. Thank you. I also want to thank you. I've enjoyed the lecture very much. Um, uh, I just got satellite radio, and, and um, I, I find the BBC uh, a lot sharper by far than, than the domestic um, uh, questioners. I don't know if, if that's your experience also. Um, my thought about how politicians talk to each other is, is like you have Lyndon Johnson and you have Everett Dirksen and Lyndon Johnson says, I really need a couple of uh, Republican votes on this and Everett Dirksen saying something like, you know, we, we need a couple of uh, judges confirmed here and Johnson saying, oh, these are very good men and, and Dirksen saying, well, yeah, that legislation, you know, we could do something about that and no deal has ever been made you know, officially, they, they can go out and, and tell everybody that no deal was made, but obviously a deal was made. Um, uh, and they have, they have cover to say that. Uh, they're just kind of, and I'm just wondering, in the conversation between Khrushchev and Kennedy, um, you portrayed it, and, and I don't know if you have um, documents or whatever, as, as being very direct. I'm going to lie, I'm going to say this, uh, whereas Kennedy, might have put it as, you know, I, I can't make a deal about these missiles, but, but I've never been interested in, in having them there anyway, and I'm interested in peace, and then turning around and, and telling the vice president, you know, if somebody, if you called them and, and said, uh, 
we're going to pull these missiles out, I certainly wouldn't contradict you. And then he could turn around and truthfully say no actual deal was made, but obviously a deal was. So I guess I'm, I'm trying to say, um, when do, do, do does, does uh, more of a straight lying go on, and, and, and when does more of a kind of an obfuscation type situation take place? Is, is it a international versus domestic, or? No, I, I think that I would call obfuscation spinning, okay? And, and, and you're talking about the trade-off between lying and spinning. I, I believe that if a leader can deal with an issue by spinning, and that leader does not have to tell a lie, the leader will spin every time. I don't think I've come across any leaders with the possible exception of Hitler who enjoys telling lies. Uh, it's not something that, uh, that people relish. The point that I'm trying to make is that leaders tell these lies because they think it's important for the national security of their country. They think they're doing it for the welfare of all of us, okay? But if they don't have to lie, if they can deal with it another way, they'd much prefer to do that. So leaders will obfuscate all the time. And this is why if you go over to the library and you uh, rummage through all the books on deception, what you discover is that pretty much everybody says that there is a great deal of deception in everyone's daily life. And the argument here is that you can't sort of deal with your wife or your husband or your kids without spinning all the time. So there's lots of spinning, there's lots of concealment, and there are even white lies, you know, which are generally considered to be permissible. And sometimes you even tell bold-faced lies because you think it's good for uh, the benefit of, of other people. Uh, my mother is elderly, and I've told her a number of bold-faced lies uh, for the purposes of sparing her pain. I guess you might consider those white lies, but nevertheless, they are lies. But I'm not telling them for selfish reasons. I'm telling them for her benefit. But the point is, there's just a lot of deception in our everyday life. And when Everett Durson and LBJ get together, uh, there's no question that they're going to tell each other um, some stories that uh, uh, are not completely true. Uh, they'll be spinning with each other. But I think in most cases, they don't lie. Uh, I think lying is actually quite rare. Thank you. Um, in, the, in the case of the Iraq war and in Vietnam, you seem to have uh, a certain amount of trust in the American people to evaluate um, a, an international strategy uh, correctly. Um, Whereas in the case of the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, you seem to think that Kennedy was really right, um, that the American people couldn't know really what was going on. Um, so what's the difference between the two cases? Well, in, in the cu case of the Cuban Missile Crisis, I didn't elaborate just because of time constraints. The real problem that he would have faced is that the Republicans would have clobbered him. Uh, Barry Goldwater uh, was then the leading figure in the Republican Party. Uh, and in fact, President Kennedy expected to run against Barry Goldwater in 1964. Instead, LBJ ran against Goldwater because Kennedy was assassinated. But the Republican was uh, very, Republican Party was very hardline, very right wing at the time. And Kennedy felt that it wasn't so much the American public per se uh, that would kill the deal, it was the Republican Party putting the compromise up in bright lights and pounding him politically that would undermine the deal, okay? So that's why he, uh, he, he, he covered it up. But the other point I would make to you is different presidents at different times make different assessments of the American people. Uh, there are, you know, you talk to 10 professors at the University of Chicago about what they think regarding the American public's ability to assess complicated issues, and you'll probably get 10 different views. Uh, and the same thing would be true with regard to leaders. Um, my question's about the uh, sort of the future of, liar, of uh, leaders lying to their own public. 
um, if the opportunity for lying or, or if the ease of lying is increased by the tendency to trust rather than to verify, uh, do you think that uh, techn technological advances, you know, with the internet, increased uh, access to information, i.e., uh, increased ability to verify information, and maybe a aware uh, wider awareness of leaders lying to their own publics? Um, with those uh, uh, trends, do you see a difference in uh, the the way that leaders go about lying to the publics in the future? Yeah, I've been asked this question a number of times, and it's obviously a terrific question. It's basically a question that boils down to, does the internet make lying more or less difficult? Uh, and one might think, given that I just said that uh, lying has become reasonably easy given the uh, mainstream media's failure to uh, look closely at what administrations are saying and try to ferret out the truth that maybe because the internet has now become so powerful, it will do the job that the mainstream media uh, has not been doing in recent times. Uh, you can make that argument. Uh, you could also make the argument that the internet uh, is very good at you know reporting all sorts of information from different sources and putting it in one place, and it's good at uh, giving pundits an opportunity to express their views, uh, and those pundits otherwise would not have a platform. But it's not clear to me that there's a lot of investigative journalism going on on the internet and that that would solve the problem. So I'm quite agnostic on this issue. I, I don't, usually I have an answer for every question. I don't have a good answer to your question. Uh, I think you should write a thesis on this and uh, and educate me. But I, I'm not. I'm really not sure how to think about how the internet uh, affects lying. Uh, and and I've been asked the question a number of times. Thank you. Uh, prior to um, the Iraq War, a year or two prior to it, 60 Minutes, the television program had an interview, was talking to an official of Iraq, he might have been a prime minister or whatever, and this man was uh, questioned about mass destruction uh, material, and he said, I mean, he was so honest and he, it seemed so real, his answer was that there wasn't any. Do you, I, but I can't remember the man's name or his position. Do you know? No, I don't. Uh, but I would say to you, it, it gets back to one of the previous questioners. Just because somebody says that Iraq doesn't have WMD doesn't mean that the person is telling the truth. You know, it's very hard to be sure in, in those circumstances. I think the smart thing for the Bush administration to have said was, we have no hard evidence that Saddam has WMD, but we think that he does. That's what they should have said. And I think it was perfectly reasonable to think that Saddam had at least some WMD. The problem that the Bush administration got into is that they said that they were sure they had WMD because they actually knew where the, the weapons were. And that, of course, wasn't true. But if Saddam tells us he doesn't have WMD, which is what I reported, and you tell us that there was another one of um, his lieutenants who was on 60 Minutes and said the same thing, uh, that might make us think maybe he doesn't have WMD. How can you be sure? We have this saying in international relations, talk is cheap. Do you know what I mean? Uh, so, you know, unless we can verify, trust but verify. There you go. Uh, it, it's just hard to know. Uh, hello, thank you for your time. Um, you just alluded to uh, this issue in one of your prior responses. Uh, to me, it seems like in your argument, there is a presumption that um, the 
the American public is on many of these issues is going to be unable to properly judge what's best uh, in, uh, in, in America's interests. You know, specifically the example of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, I, uh, my question is, why is there this presumption? Why leaders, some leaders, think that that's the case? Especially um, in uh, cases of existential threats. I mean, you can probably find a number of examples where the majority opinion is probably more often right than wrong. Okay. Uh, first of all, I, I agree that there are a lot of cases where the majority opinion is right, not wrong. I, I, I personally don't make the argument that you're dealing with Bubis Americanus and therefore it's important to lie to Bubis Americanus. That's not my personal view, okay? Nevertheless, I think that there could be a situation, if you made me president of the United States, Fortunately, we don't have to worry about this happening. But if you made me president of the United States and the country was operating in a high threat environment, it might be the case that for one reason or another, I concluded, despite my rather benign view of the American public, that they, that the public was not uh, sufficiently uh, motivated to deal with a particular threat and therefore I had to engage in deception. I could imagine that happening. Uh, I don't think it's likely because I think my basic view of the issue is a lot like yours. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say it would definitely happen but I would leave myself open to that possibility. Now we have surely had leaders over time, I don't know who they were, but we surely have had a few leaders over time who think that they are dealing with Bubis Americanus. These are people who are elitist and think the public uh, is more of an obstacle than an asset uh, in thinking about foreign policy. And if you have that particular view, your first instinct is going to be one where you manipulate the public. Right, and get the public exercised. And I sort of agree with the thrust of your comments, and this is why I talked about backfiring. I think if the president has to lie or deceive the American people, then the problem is probably with the policy, not the public. See, that's what you're saying. And I think you're basically right. But again, I would leave myself open to the other, possi the, the other side or the other possibility. Uh, Thank you. Can you go to the last two questions? So when you discussed the concept of a noble lie, you alluded to JFK lying about exchanging the Jupiter missiles for the missiles in Cuba. But of course, had the journalists discovered that JFK had been lying to him when he said there was no deal, there would have been a massive scandal, it would have undermined faith in government, it would have been a political nightmare. And so my question is... And, and, and Khrushchev might not have taken the missiles out of Cuba. Indeed. So my question is, is the criteria for a noble lie its intention, which was obviously very good by JFK, the success of the lie, or both? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, well, in terms of intentions, my argument is that all of these strategic lies have noble intentions. Uh, I think uh, that when I talk about a noble lie, I'm talking about a lie that solved a truly important problem. Uh, uh, it, it dealt with an existential threat, and it worked. Uh, just to, I'm thinking as I'm answering your question, because your question's an excellent one, and I really hadn't given it a lot of thought. Uh, but some people say to me, okay, John, you told us that uh, uh, President Kennedy's lying about the Cuban Missile Crisis is an example of a noble lie. Tell us another example. And the one I go to is 
uh, President Roosevelt, Franklin D. Roosevelt, lying about the Greer incident in uh, August of 1941. Just to tell you the story, uh, President Roosevelt was deeply committed to getting us into World War II in 1941. And President Roosevelt was dealing with isolationist America. And he really could not get the United States off dead center. And you want to remember, up until June 22nd, 1941, June 22nd, 1941, when the Germans invaded the Soviet Union, Germany and the Soviet Union were allies, and Britain was basically fighting all alone against Nazi Germany, which was allied with the Soviet Union. So up until June 41, but of course even after June 41, Roosevelt is scrambling like crazy to see if he can get the Americans, if not into the war, at least helping Britain in a really major league way for all the obvious reasons. Uh, anyway, there's a naval incident that takes place in the Atlantic Ocean off the American coast in August 1941 involving a German submarine, uh, a British aircraft, and an American surface ship. And Roosevelt tells a series of lies to the American people. Eric Alderman talks about this in his book. He tells a series of lies to the American people about that incident that are designed to make it look like the Germans are responsible for the incident and they are threatening the United States. And what he's trying to do is get us into the war. Now, I refer to that as a noble lie because I think it was absolutely imperative that we get into World War II against Nazi Germany and to a lesser extent against Japan. Some of the people in the audience have heard me talk about how I believe Roosevelt engineered us into the war by, in effect, pushing the Japanese to attack us in uh, December 1941. Uh, the Japanese were trying to get off the hook. They had no interest in going to war with the United States. And I believe Roosevelt pushed the Japanese to attack us. And I believe he was right to do that because it was imperative that we get into the war. So if you think like I do, I'm not saying you have to agree with me on the importance of getting into World War II. But if you think like I do, that it was imperative to get into World War II, right, then lying about the Greer incident does categor can be categorized as a noble lie. But the fact is, it failed. It didn't work. The American people hardly moved an inch on the issue of involvement in World War II. So one could argue if your criterion is success, on an important issue, this is certainly an important issue, but he didn't f succeed, then it's not a noble lie. If you're looking at just intentions, I think it was a noble lie. Thank you. Um, so on the topic of uh, interstate lying, uh, have in, in you know your research, have you observed any differences between representative and authoritarian governments or open and closed societies. Um, in particular, I'm thinking about Stalin and Mao, who lied profusely to the international communist movement about what was going on in their countries. Um, um, and, you know, put window dressing on the atrocities that they were committing. And I mean, even Stalin especially was very effective in this. He basically used the New York Times as a propaganda organ in the 30s, and this so-called journalism won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, so, uh, so yeah, just, ha, ha, w do you think there's a difference between, so, inner, you uh, know, uh, totalitarian and representative? Yeah, excellent question. I, I said in the beginning of the book that uh, I had never thought about this subject before, and I viewed the book as sort of a starting point uh, for discussing these issues. Uh, and uh, there, Obviously, some issues I've told you about, one that come up from the audience that I really hadn't thought about, and one of the previous questioners was pushing me on something I hadn't thought about. Uh, I did not see any evidence of, uh, uh, of authoritarian leaders 
engaging in interstate lying more often than democratic leaders, which is what you're saying. Uh, I did see, as I reported to you, and as I say in the book, that I saw evidence of leaders, democratic leaders, lying to their publics more often than non-democratic leaders. But I even qualified that because I argued that in the age of nationalism, where popular sovereignty is a core concept, that leaders, even of authoritarian states, have to pay attention to their publics. And I talk about Hitler in that regard. It's quite amazing how much attention Hitler and his propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, paid to public attention in the Third Reich. Right? And that's because of nationalism. But anyway, my main point was that democracies are more likely to see lies by the leaders to their public. But on interstate line, I did not see any evidence that, uh, that authoritarian leaders lied more often. You remember the gentleman who uh, was up here earlier who talked about Hitler. Hitler would be more evidence for your basic perspective. Uh, but the truth is you can find quite a few examples of democratic leaders telling interstate lies uh, as well as non-democratic leaders. But you may be onto something. But to prove to me that you're correct, you'd have to show me what all those lies are that Stalin told and Mao told and other authoritarian leaders. Because I'm very suspicious when you tell me that they told all these lies. Because as I said in my talk, people often say, oh, there are all these examples of lies. And then when they show me the evidence, they're really not lies or there are not many of them. So you'd have to show me there are lots of examples of authoritarian leaders telling lies to other leaders or other or to foreign audiences, and much more so than democratic leaders. And then the final thing that you have to do for me in your thesis 